Hey everybody, it's Dr. Rom. I'm just sitting here on my swing. Is that a cool swing or what? Look at this. It's in my backyard. Uh, we got a little playground for my daughter over here. Anyway, so I want to talk to you guys today about um, why butter and uh, beef and eggs is making a comeback. And what's, what's really the science behind that? And uh, is there any science behind that? Um, so for those of you who have never met me, my name is Dr. Cheng Ron. I'm a board certified internal medicine physician. And uh, some people are hopping on live. This is a Facebook live discussion about three of my favorite items to eat and why it's making a comeback and are there any real concerns about it making a comeback. Hey Valerie, how are you? Thanks for joining in. And so um, let's start with butter. Everybody's wondering about butter. Uh, recently on Time Magazine, if you guys look in the, uh, if you look, guys Google Time Magazine, the, the latest cover, it's a, it's, a, it's a big glob of helping of butter on there and it talks about is butter back. And, uh, and it's a real interesting uh, cover and a real interesting picture. This is a big giant glob of butter and they're talking about uh, there's some myths that we've been really, really discussing whether butter is really good for you or not. And I think there's a lot of careful considerations that we really have to take upon. So let's talk about butter. What, what, what really is butter? Butter is a mixture, butter is a fat, right? It's a mixture of saturated fat. And uh, the good, high quality butters from grass-fed cows are actually orangish in color and not really uh, pale. And a lot of them are dark yellow. And the, the more orange and dark yellow butter is, the more beta carotene it has, which is, the, which is uh, what's in carrots and stuff. And it's good for you. And so is butter back? Well, butter's back. Well, there's, there's an asterisk for that. Okay, so um, we used to use margarine. The U.S. diet used to use a lot of margarine in our diet. What we now know about margarine is, first of all, margarine is basically trans fat. It's, it's, it's a man-made trans fat and trans fats are absolutely horrible for you the, um, your body does not recognize trans fat your body doesn't know what to do with it you can develop you can develop a lot of autoimmune issues when you use trans fat and um, and you know so so margarine has been sort of banned by the FDA and we have and a lot of trans fats are banned by the FDA and by the government which is a good thing but now that puts butter back in the equation, right? So why, why, why was butter not great in the beginning? So the, 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 bad, the bad rep that butter really got was because it's got this high saturated fat and saturated fat is supposedly associated with worsening cardiovascular disease according to the American Heart Association. And the, um, and, but is it, is it really? Is it really? So let's look at some of the studies that was done before a very long time ago and some of the recent studies. So there are some studies that suggest that those people with increased saturated fat intake are have a higher likelihood of stroke and heart attack and worsening obesity than those who don't. And I'm gonna say that's an observation. It's an observation that those who consume more butter tend to be fatter and have type 2 diabetes and have worsening outcome. Yes. Um, and that, is that really because of butter? We don't know, because when you look at an observational study, you can't determine cause and, cause and effect. I can say that every morning I wake up, the sun has, has risen. And does that mean the, every, every morning I wake up and the fact that I'm waking up is making the sun rise? No, it doesn't mean that. It's an observation, right? Those two, those two things or those two behaviors are linked. So when we look at these observational studies, you really gotta be careful. You really have to think that, okay, those who consume more butter tend to have worsening diabetes and worsening uh, heart disease. Well, that's because what did these people put butter on? They put butter on toast, they put butter on biscuits, they put butter on grain-based carbohydrates, wheat products, and these are the things that worsen insulin resistance, which, and in turn, insulin uh, is like a fat fertilizer, it makes you fat. And these are the things that people put butter on, so is butter, uh, is butter associated with worsening outcomes? Yeah, in these populations. But is butter itself, butter itself, if you consume it on its own without bread, without, without, without uh, any carbohydrates, is that going to be good for you? We don't, studies shows there's not really a strong association with isolated butter alone or saturated fat alone 
with a worsened cardiovascular outcome. But if you put butter onto, onto toast, and I don't care if it's wheat, I don't care if it's white, if you put butter onto toast, that toast will elevate your blood insulin levels and cause you to deposit fat, right? And so while butter itself is not the problem, um, the things that people eat with butter can be the problem. Now, if you use butter to cook, that's okay. If you use butter to have an omelet like I did this morning and where there's nothing that will really spike my insulin a whole lot, then it's not going to lead to uh, worsening uh, cardiovas cardiovascular disease or uh, vascular disease as much as we think it did. So is butter back? Yeah, it's definitely back. It's back with a vengeance. But if you're using butter on uh, with other carbohydrates and if you're eating more carbohydrates because you're bringing butter back into your life then no it's not going to work for you it's really not going to work for you so that that that's the consideration i give another consideration is a type of butter not all butter is created equal right if you have butter that you open it in the package and the package is, is is white and barely yellow then it's not a very natural looking butter butter naturally is supposed to be dark yellow or even orange and, uh, and uh, you know, butter, I like butter from grass-fed cows. And uh, my favorite brand that uh, my friend Mimi Chan, I'm giving her a shout out, uh, turned me on to was Kerrygold's. Kerrygold's is imported Irish butter, and they import Irish butter from pasture-raised and pasture-finished cows, which means you are what your food eats. The cows eat grass, the cows get phytonutrients, and they produce this dairy product called milk. <laughs> and then that's what the butter is made from. And because of that, the butter actually has a lot of antioxidant nutrients, a lot of vitamins A, D, E, and K2 in them. And uh, it's almost, it's, it sounds like a perfect food. If I can just list out everything that butter has, it almost sounds like a perfect food. Almost as good as eggs uh, for those that have natural butter. So if you do consume butter, don't consume with carbs. And if you do consume butter, I suggest um, something like uh, uh, Kerrygold's, which is uh, grass-fed, uh, made from grass-fed cows, grass-fed butter. And if you go to Whole Foods, if you go to HP, there's, there's three or four other brands of grass-fed butter that I've seen um, that could be pretty good. But, you know, nothing will fool, your eye, fool your, your eye. If you open a package of butter and it looks white, it looks really clear, uh, it's not great for you. If it's dark yellow, if it's orange, go for it. If you get butter from the farmer's market, none of that thing is, is, is light yellow. None of, none of them are, are truly white. Um, they all have a darker color because of the increased amount of antioxidants, beta carotene in it. Um, so where do you get grass-fed butter? So uh, Whole Foods is a good place to get. Uh, we're in Texas. For those of you watching that are not in Texas, we have something called HEB here, which is a really big grocery store. Um, but you can find it. Uh, Kerrygold's is actually available in a lot of different places. I actually um, I just found out you can order it online, too. I don't know how that works. Um, but... Um, but that's consideration about butter. Butter and saturated fat, right? So let's jump to talk about eggs and jump to talk about beef. So eggs and eggs and beef got a really bad rep because of the high cholesterol content, right? And so now we talk about cholesterol. Now what is cholesterol a big deal? Cholesterol is a bigger deal than most or cholesterol is not as big of a deal as most people make it out to be. I think the, the focus on the cholesterol being the bad guy in the American diet is, is, is wrong. <laughs> Dietary cholesterol actually does not turn into the bad LDL cholesterol that's in, our, that's in our system. What raises our cholesterol is actually a loaf of bread or a pastry. These things raise our cholesterol because it causes us to have insulin spikes. And the more insulin we have in our body... Uh, the more insulin resistance we get. And insulin is a fat fertilizer. And not only that, it goes to the liver and tells the liver to make all this bad stuff. And one of them is cholesterol, right? And so, um, how now that we know that dietary cholesterol does not raise LDL or bad cholesterol or raise LDL particle sizes, which is more important, I'll get to that on another video. Um, and uh, now it's kind of making a comeback. And if you look at the 2015 dietary guidelines, which actually came out in 2016 in January, the final version of it, um, they also brought eggs and beef back. So this is the first time in American history that of the start of the dietary guidelines that you're really bringing back dietary cholesterol. I mean, that hasn't happened in decades. And then American Heart Association in 2015 
also says um, dietary cholesterol does not uh, raise bad cholesterol. But American Heart Association also uh, says you have you should have limited consumption of saturated fat, which I don't necessarily agree with because I'm a big fan of coconut oil. <laughs> and so, um, and so, I mean, looking at looking at LDL cholesterol, is is cholesterol really the bad guy? It really depends. Not all LDL is necessarily bad. You have different particle sizes that correspond to different vascular diseases, and uh, these lower particle sizes um, can um, can oxidize and do really harmful things and inflammatory things to to your circulation. These are the cholesterol that matter. Uh, what you find interesting is that a lot the cholesterol medicine like statins don't necessarily decrease those type of cholesterol, um, and that's why statins themselves uh, like simvastatin, you know, Lipitor, um, uh, atorvastatin, which is Lipitor, simvastatin is Zocor. These medications um, are not shown to uh, improve. Uh, or uh, prolong someone's life who doesn't have existing coronary disease, existing heart disease or, or stroke. And so, um, but, um, but cholesterol has been made out to be the bad guy. What we should really focus on is how much food you're taking that's going to spike your insulin level or how insulin resistant you are. We know the number one uh, risk factor for heart disease and stroke is insulin resistance. Okay? And those people who are the most insulin resistant are, are type 2 diabetics. And so, um, so you know, in, in talking about insulin resistance, if you're eating food that's causing you to rise in insulin, like processed sugars, carbohydrates, uh, or the bad carbs, the grain-based carbohydrates, as I call them, um, starches, and these things can, can elevate your, your, uh, your insulin level, then the higher the, your insulin level over time, the more insulin resistance you get, and that is the number one cause of heart disease, heart disease and strokes uh, in this country. And so, yeah, cholesterol has been made out to be a bad, bad guy. Um, saturated fats have been made out to be a bad guy, but they're not as bad as we think. Uh, but no one looks at whole grain toast as being bad, but I do. You know, I, I look at it and I think that if I eat this grain, it's gonna, it may be pro-inflammatory for me, which, you know, I, I know grain is inflammatory for, for, for my body, so I don't want to eat it. And um, I also know that um, it's going to spike my insulin level, which goes towards fat deposition, which goes towards fat making, makes fatty liver disease. So, and so, I mean, these are the reasons why, why eggs and beef and butter is back, it's because we now have this information that we've actually known for a very long time, um, but uh, these type of information, the reason why you're only hearing about it in 2016, why dietary cholesterol is not so bad and saturated fat is not so bad, the reason you're hearing about it in 2016 is back because it's, it's largely political. There's a, there's a big movement to take back our own health in this country. Healthcare expenditure has expanded, and uh, if you look at the milk and dairy industry and the grain industry, and the cereal industry, these are multi-billion dollar industries. Uh, if you look at pharmaceutical industry, of course, another multi-billion dollar industry. These industries do not benefit by me telling you this information. They may suffer by me telling you this information. Okay, and they don't like that. Um, and, but a lot of dietary guidelines and a lot of uh, recommendations made by different associations, government associations in this country are unfortunately have been historically biased. Um, but, uh, but if you look at the actual data, look at the, the study designs, um, and don't treat observational studies like it's gold, um, and you really see the truth behind it all. And so, and so, <clears throat> um, uh, but let's talk about, earlier I talked about grass-fed butter, so let's talk about, let's talk about beef. All right, red meat. Is red meat bad? Uh, if you have gout, it may be bad, but overall, red meat, if you eat beef, um, I do suggest, and I've made this change for my family, to, to switch to um, uh, grass-fed and grass-finished beef, which means that they graze in the pasture, and as they eat phytochemicals, as they eat these vegetables, they actually get, um, my microphone is a little off, they, as they eat these vegetables, they, they, um, in their bloodstream, they get all these phytonutrients and they build their muscles and you know if you're eating beef we're eating the the muscles and the fat of the beef and these beef actually does have omega-3 content in them uh like what you know uh, wild fish does 
You're like, omega threes, those are good. Those are good for you, right? Omega threes are wonderful for you. So that's why we made the switch to to grass fed grass fed beef, and they're extremely expensive though. Um, but I think we need to have more focus on buying higher quality food in, in America in general. You know, I'd rather spend my money on higher quality food than buy an extra iPhone. So you know, it's it's uh, it's all about it's all about displacement of of spending for for me and my family, right? So grass-fed beef. Where can you find grass-fed beef? They can be found uh, in most grocery stores. I um, I don't. There's not a grocery store where I haven't found grass-fed beef. A lot of them are prepackaged. There's some Australian, New, Ze- New Zealand beef that are imported. There's a lot of Texas. Well, I'm in Texas. I love Texas beef. There's a lot of Texas beef that are pasture-raised and, and grass-finished and, and grass-fed. Those can be found at HEB. Once again, those can be found at Whole Foods. Uh, Randall's and different grocery stores. If you're not in Texas, you can also find them. I found them in New York when I was living there as well. Uh, are they expensive? Yeah, they're expensive, but uh, you can eat them pretty much guilt-free, um, as long as you uh, as long as you don't eat it with a giant loaf of garlic bread or something like that. <laughs> so, so you know when you when you have when you have uh, when you when you eat certain foods, you make sure you don't want to sabotage the rest of your diet. You know, I think there's been a fixation in America on looking at one food item, saying it's good for you, and eating a crap ton of it without really uh, looking at anything else. And I think that's a big problem, right? Um, and uh, you know, like I said, the thing about butter is butter back. Yeah, butter is back. Believe that butter is back. But um, if you're eating butter on top of on top of bread then it allows you to eat more bread because you're buying more butter, then no, that butter is bad for you. Get away from that butter because it links you to eating with carbohydrates. Now, if you're replacing your vegetable oil at home with butter, then fantastic because vegetable oil is mostly soybean oil, which is, uh, which can become oxidized and rancid even while it's in the packaging. It's pro-inflammatory. Then, then, then using butter instead of vegetable oil is actually not a bad idea. And so, um, and uh, one more point on uh, fats and saturated fats is I, I like to use coconut oil too. And coconut oil is, is high in saturated fat. If you, ever, you, get, if you guys ever use MyFitnessPal and you type in coconut oil, it gives you a warning. This is high in saturated fat in big red letters. I, I look at it I'm like, yeah, I know it is. I'm, I'm purposely putting this into my body. Because coconut oil is the only saturated fat that bypasses the biliary systems. For those of you who had um, uh, cholecystectomy, it's got your gallbladder taken out. Um, coconut oil is something that you should cook with because it doesn't irritate you as, as much. And, uh, and coconut oil has a lot more than just saturated fat going for it. Coconut oil has a lot of different nutrients that are in there, really good um, uh, essential fatty acids that are in there as well. Um, that's really good for you. And so you know, people use coconut oil on their skin, on their hair, fantastic. Using the food, fantastic. You know, go, go ahead for that. I know this, this talk was not really about coconut oil, but I just wanted to piggyback on that since we've been talking about uh, uh, saturated fat and cholesterol. So coconut oil is super high in cholesterol also. And, but uh, I am not afraid. I am not afraid because I do not use coconut oil uh, to do anything except cook my vegetables and cook my meat. I do not eat coconut oil with grain-based carbohydrates, pastries, processed sugars, or anything like that. So it's not going to matter for me. But for those of you who do, for those of you who use butter on bread, um, no, then butter is not great for you. If you use butter to cook your eggs, if you use butter to cook vegetables, um, put some butter into a package of, of uh, vegetables for steaming, then yeah, it's going to be good for you. Okay? And so, thanks a lot for listening in. If you find this helpful, go ahead and share this video. If you share this video, I would absolutely love it. So, right now, let me answer some questions. If you guys have any questions, go ahead and type that out. There's, there's, like, a, there's like a 15 second delay between the live video and actually seeing what you guys type. So, I might have to like burn time for 15 seconds. But hey, Nicole, welcome to the feed. Thanks for coming in. Barbara, you're, you're always supporting me. Thank you so much. Uh, I haven't seen you in a while, probably because I haven't done live video in a while either. Uh, uh, Debbie, hi, how are you? Smart Balance, okay. Label says non-GMO. Smart Balance what? <laughs> smart Balance, are you talking about the butter Smart Balance? Um, smart Balance is actually, um, they have different mixtures. They have a mixture of uh, butter and uh, omega-3 oils, like uh, olive oil. 
And so if you're talking about that, that's that's totally cool. That's 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 very good. Um, but uh, I'm not too familiar with Smart Balance because I don't purchase the products. Um, but I'm gonna have to look into it now. But I know they have a they have a mixture oil. My stipulation about mixing omega-3 oils with something like butter is that they have two different smoking points. So whenever you heat an oil and it starts smoking, it becomes a chemical, and it's actually it's actually you know really not good for you at all. Um, once it becomes that chemical, it becomes pro-inflammatory. You want to throw the oil away. Just start over. Let the pan cool. Just start over. Don't cook with oil that's been smoking. Hey, Brenda. Uh, awesome information. Thanks for sharing. Thank you for watching. Um, you had to adjust butter and give up the grains. Oh, yeah. Th oh, that's awesome. I'm glad you make that change. I'm really glad you make that change. Um, and I hope you feel better because of it, too. Uh, but I can talk about... I could talk about this forever. Um, but anyways, uh, I am going to get off the feed now. So if you guys have any questions, just go ahead and put it into the comments. And uh, I'll, I'll address them. If you guys want me to talk about anything else, I'll definitely address them uh, as well. Um, but uh, we, I think, as, as you know, in, in our country, in America, and this is where I'm broadcasting from, which is Texas, we have a long way to go in terms of really looking at our food and our diet. And since I am a big supporter of using food as medicine, and I do think move, food can reverse a lot of chronic diseases, and I've seen it done. I am the author of a type 2 diabetes reversal book that's found on Amazon. And uh, if you want to go to my website, it's dustoffdiabetes.com, D-U-S-T-O-F-F, diabetes.com. Check that out. And, uh, you know, I, you know I'm, I'll be coming out with a lot more different ideas and different... different um, different evidence-based research and medicine that I've seen about uh, more dietary stuff uh, along the way. So I truly hope that you share this and I truly hope that you enjoyed it. So thanks a lot for watching.